and that there will be some tangible ideas that, that folks can use uh, throughout. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get going um, with the webinar today. Um, all participants have been muted. Um, if you want to ask a question, uh, which we encourage you to do, uh, this is all about sharing your own stories as well as listening to the stories of the folks on the line, asking questions and, and trying to, to learn more. Um, so if you'd like to do that, you can hover your cursor over your uh, window and click the unmute button uh, and that should, uh, that should unmute mine. Um, I would also encourage everyone, uh, if they would like to, to use the chat bar um, down to the right. So um, I can give you an example of how I might do that. Um, if you'd like to leave your name uh, and the organization you work with, um, that would be great. Um, and on, and on the other side, if you have examples of the work that you're doing that you'd like to share, um, please leave that in, in the chat box there and um, people can follow up through it in that way. Uh, so as I mentioned off the, off the top, um, we are going to be recording this session uh, so that other folks are going to be able to access these and, and hopefully uh, learn a thing or two. Um, so uh, please keep that in mind uh, as we go forward that uh, this will be recorded uh, and we will be releasing this um, to, uh, to help folks uh, participate who weren't able to make it today. So just to quickly go back to um, what it is ROI has been up to, um, we've been pulling together a number of case studies, as I mentioned, to help rural communities learn from other rural communities, uh, to help build capacity, to help inspire. Um, the entrepreneurship webinar series um, has taken a lot of the case studies we've been working on and brought them into some, some key theme areas. Um, so today we'll be looking at inspiring young entrepreneurs, looking at youth entrepreneurship. Um, on June 6th, we'll be looking at repurposing space. So what communities have been doing with um, either vacant or underused uh, space in their communities to add, uh, to create a value added uh, activity there around entrepreneurship. The third on June 12th, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at ecosystem building. So what are the communities doing to create networks and to create an environment that, that help entrepreneurs uh, prosper and thrive? Um, and the final one on June 20th will be Win This Space. So please sign up for all of those and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to bringing those to you. Today, as I mentioned, we're looking at uh, inspiring young entrepreneurs. Um, so we have uh, a number of uh, really great examples on the line today. We have Tracy Snow from Economic Development Officer from Lennox and Agnesing. We have Chris Carwood, Economic Development Off Coordinator from Norfolk County. Uh, we have Lois Shaw and Barb Smith from the Brock Youth Center. And we have Emily Morrison from Launchpad Youth Activity and Technology Center. So we're very excited to have these folks on the line. I would like to say that these are just a just a handful of all the great work that is happening throughout rural Ontario. I know that there's so many other programs and, and energetic entrepreneurs out there that are, that are either kickstarting programs or, or doing it themselves. Um, so I, I wanted to contextualize that, that we wanted to try and bring uh, a few good examples to the table and, and help inspire some conversation. Um, Youth entrepreneurship was a, was a particularly exciting one for ROI to come across. We've done a lot of work recently around youth engagement um, because we firmly believe that, uh, that working with youth is an important part of community development going forward, looking at youth retention, youth attraction and reattraction to help, uh, help revitalize our rural communities. So we're very excited to have the folks on the line. And without further ado, I will turn it over to, uh, to Tracy now um, to share her story. Hello, everybody. Can everybody see me okay? Mm -hmm. So my name is Tracy Snow, and I've been, I'm the Economic Development Officer for the County of Lennox and Addington. I've been working for the county in the economic development role for nine years now, but have been a business coach or business owner my whole life, uh, too long to say. And I guess I was really excited to be part of this group and, and part of this project in terms of learning what's out in our communities 
for entrepreneurship and uh, fortunate enough to be invited to talk about one of the programs that we've been running, which actually we're very fortunate as well that we, we won an award last year, a marketing award from EDAC on this particular program uh, for being a, a really neat one. Uh, in my role as an economic developer, uh, working with all entrepreneurs at all levels, uh, young, older, uh, transitional uh, businesses that are selling, expanding in every capacity uh, as a business. That's my role in our office uh, to help. And a big part of helping some of these entrepreneurs was working with the high schools. We have three high schools in our region. Working with the high schools to help them understand what entrepreneurship is. So when I was working with the high schools, uh, we were also noticing that um, one of the programs was Summer Company. And so Summer Company was a great initiative to help students uh, look at starting a business, great business plan templates that they would use, um, and then some funding that they would be able to access during the summer. But over the years, in terms of me working with students at the high school level, we were noticing that enrollment uh, in our high schools was actually diminishing at the entrepreneurship level. So enrollment for business courses, entrepreneurship courses, at the high school level was actually getting less. In fact, so bad so that, um, again, we're very rural. So our total population base over 3,500 square kilometers is only 45,000. Largest population is Napanee, which has about 21,000 people. So of the three high schools within our county, two of the high schools actually don't offer business or entrepreneurship programs at all. And we were realizing, and that was a big chunk of our geography, and we were realizing that this is a, it's an absolute issue, and not because we want everybody to be an entrepreneur in our community, but because we want people to understand what entrepreneurship means. And uh, what we were finding is a lot of younger individuals, actually even at, of all ages, didn't really have an understanding of what entrepreneurship was and what being a business owner was. And, you know, the, the scary the scary connotation of, you know, when you're a business owner, you have to wear multiple hats and you have to juggle all the balls and, you know, all these businesses are shutting down. And so we felt it was our job to really start teaching what entrepreneurship was and what being a business owner was. And because of the diminishing numbers in terms of enrollment for business at high school level and to the high schools dropping it completely, we felt that talking to the grade six, seven and eights, to really get them to understand what entrepreneurship was, what being a business owner was, so that when they went into high school, they would then look at the business courses and go, oh, okay, now I understand. Because what was happening in the past was they would look at the business and entrepreneurship courses and they would go, well, I don't want to be a business owner, so I'm not going to apply for the course. Not knowing it was just really good information to know, you know, whether you want to get a job or you want to make a job. And so about two and a half years ago, we thought about this problem that we were having and thought, well, we need to be speaking to the grade six, seven, and eights at the elementary level to help make them better understand what that meant. And so that hopefully during high school that they would then take some of those courses. And again, through secondary education, whether college or university go, okay, so now I can either make a job or I can, I can get a job. Uh, in doing that, we did a lot of research and we decided that the kind of the science fair model with grade schools typically worked, especially for the education system. Uh, they really kind of liked that organizational plan. They liked things kind of set so that there was a, an understanding of, you know, what the expectations were for the students, what the role was from the school board and the teachers to the students to help them implement that. So we kind of used a science fair or history fair as, as kind of our guideline on what that kidpreneur fair would look like. Um, and I'm going to share just a few, um, a few little photos of it. And there we go. So this is our logo, our Kidpreneur logo. And uh, what we did was we started about two years ago, we started going to all the great schools. And this is actually one of our um, motivational speakers, Peter Katz, for this year. So the rule was we went to all of the grade schools and we started talking to the principals and we had conversations about two and a half years ago with all the principals talking about what Kidpreneur meant, you know, how we could implement that into their school systems and make it simple. We didn't want to be adding extra work to the teachers and didn't want to be adding extra work to each of the classes. So this program, uh, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. I'm just going to stop this now. Um, 
we want to make this program as simple as possible so that they didn't feel it was extra work on their plate on top of all the other curriculum they had to be taken care of. Uh, so we did, went around, we did PowerPoint presentations to uh, a number of the schools that were interested in participating. First year, there was approximately, uh, I think it was like four or five of our schools. We have 11 elementary schools in our region. Um, we did some PowerPoint presentations, talked about young entrepreneurs, uh, youth entrepreneurs. So for example, Bombardier, for example, uh, the snowmobile was actually created by a teenager years and years ago who, who came up with a motor sled in a snow. Uh, the trampoline was actually created by a teenager uh, and, and I'm not sure how that story went, but you know, we gave examples of how these, these businesses and these products and services were actually created by teenagers many, many years ago. Um, we then also had local speakers that were young entrepreneurs that we had been working with through high school and talking to the students. In that process, uh, after we did our presentation to all of the classes at these six schools initially the first year, um, we then offered the teacher kind of a step-by-step -step guideline of what the expectations were of that Kidpreneur Fair. So these, these are the things that the, the students need to be talking about. They could do it in groups or they could be doing it individually. Um, and sorry, my dog just seems to want to talk to me right now. My apologies. Um, and so then uh, the teachers then could show the students, okay, these are the things, you know, so who is your product and service? Who's your customer? How much are you going to charge for your product or service? Very simple, basic things. Uh, what is the cost of your product or service? And then how are you going to market it? So really those five key things of that business piece. In that time, they would then work together either individually or as a, as a group. And then uh, we would meet with them once again, sit down with the classes and talk to them once again about uh, their process. Uh, and then we did a fair. So each of the schools then did a fair on their own. Again, my apologies. Um, so we did a fair on, on their own. We would go and help actually walk around and talk to each of the students at their fair. Once the fair happened at each of the individual schools, we would pick four or five students from each of those schools. And then we had our own county fair uh, kid printer fair at our county offices and the first year that ran we had approximately 75 students participate uh, I think it was five or six schools uh, we had a really lovely yeah. young entrepreneur from Toronto who had started uh, in grade school a, a cupcake business and she came and talked and then we handed out awards um, at the end of it to the top three or four uh, within that group we invited so it wasn't us voting, we invited local community members, uh, the mayor, the people from schools, local business owners to come and be judges as part of that uh, initiative. So after our first year, media came, newspapers and radio were coming, uh, our local TV station out of Kingston came and, and did a spot on us. And the school boards actually found out about the program through the media and also through their principals and their teachers engaged. And we're so excited that the boards actually brought us in to talk to us about enrolling it right across the system. Um, so then we were very lucky because the board then said to all of the principals within our region, you guys need to be involved in this and somehow figure this out within your curriculum. This year we ran it again and we had, uh, I think 10 schools participating, nine or 10 schools participating. We had over a hundred and 30 students involved, 135 students involved, um, and very similar. So each of the schools did their own Kidpreneur Fair. We then brought some of those students into the big county fair and then followed it uh, and followed it that way. Uh, I think for us, doing Kidpreneur was, is very helpful, again, not to reinforce that we want everybody to be a business owner, but what we want them to know is that they have choices. And that's really important for us is that we want our students and our youth to know that they have choices in life. And a lot of times when a person, even an adult who think about starting a business, it's very scary for them. And so we want to eliminate that fear and let them know that, you know, it takes planning, it takes community support, it takes resources to get a really successful business going. And that we as a county offer all of that, that support and those uh, systems in place to help them make those choices. And through all of this, we really stress that education was priority. Secondary education, which, whether it was college or university was priority. And that after that, that you know, making those choices. We also gave them examples because a lot of times people don't realize that 
for example, in the trades industry, if you're a, um, an electrician, for example, many, many times, if you're not working with uh, a business, you're actually an entrepreneur. You are running your own business as an electrician or a plumber or an, a mechanic or, and so we're trying to give even a farmer, you know, in, Mary, they, in many of our rural communities, farming is a major, major industry. And farmers are actually entrepreneurs. And so we're trying to give examples of what entrepreneurship means to our youth so that as they grow up and they, and they become adults, they can say, hey, you know what, I went to college to be a tradesperson, or I went to college to be a computer programmer, or I went to college to be, you know, a, a hairdresser. So then the next question is, okay, so I'm a computer programmer. Do I want to work for a company or do I want to start my own company? You know, I'm a hairdresser. Do I want to work for somebody or do I want to start that? And so we're finding that it's allowing, you know, a lot more choice uh, down the road for our, our youth. And, and the goal, honestly, is also, you know, because we all talk about youth engagement and youth engagement and, you know, sustainability within our small rural communities. And, you know, I think a little bit of the goal is to allow them to sh and show them that they have choices, even in our rural communities, to start businesses, that they don't have to go to the big city. No disrespect, disrespect to the big city. I've grown up and lived in big cities. But they don't have to go to the big city to be an entrepreneur or to have a business. They can also do it from rural communities. And, you know, with broadband, you know, becoming greater and, and internet accessibility across the region becoming more prevalent, uh, prevalent uh, you know, we really see this as a viable option, uh, you know, for, for our community. Yeah, so I, I, I guess that's, that's kind of where our program is, and, and we're continuing it every year and, and hoping to grow it and, and make it uh, more awesome every time. Brian, did you yeah. have questions? Yeah, thanks very much, Tracy. It's a, a really great story, and, and it's exciting to see the kind of energy uh, and, and how much it's grown over the years and the interest that it's received uh, throughout the school board. Certainly a great story of connecting uh, the work that a community does uh, or an organization around community development with uh, students uh, in the schools. Um, because of your, your strong connection with the schools, I was wondering if you, uh, if you might have any advice for folks around how you were able to um, how you're able to connect with the schools and to um, to get the support of the principals and the teachers um, in, in going through this program. So that's a very good question. Uh, it was tough initially because, I mean, thank goodness we have a very good reputation from a community standpoint. Our economic development uh, department is very involved in the community in all aspects. So it wasn't like we were strangers going into the schools and saying, hey, we have this great program, like a salesperson. We were actually just talking about the reasons why we wanted to start the program and more of a, an educational benefit to them. Um, the, th the biggest thing that we realized was that we have to keep it simple because their, their curriculum and expectations from their bosses and their boards and each of the schools is so much and they are, you know, very limited time in terms of what they have uh, to offer um, those expectations to their students. So we, the simpler, the better really showed us that there was great engagement, you know, is, is if we could make their life simpler, if we made the process in terms of what the expectations were from the students and the teachers simpler, then uh, it really had uh, a better yes. Some teachers got extremely engaged and actually incorporated in some of the curriculum, whether it was math or other subjects. Some teachers just followed the program, which was great, and then did it, you know, based on just those expectations. So. I think as we're rolling it out, you know, next year will be year three and other teachers and other schools are talking about it um, and realizing that it's not a, a burden. It's more of a, an incentive and a, an, an additional opportunity for those students to be aware of. Um, I, I think I'm quite sure that it's going to get bigger. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Those are certainly some great insights into, into working with the schools. Um, I am going to uh, just flag that um, so Tracy does have to, to leave us a little bit early, which is why I wanted to jump into a few questions for her. And I'm so, so sorry. Uh, so, please, so please think about um, some questions for Tracy. Um, uh, and Tracy, I just have one more question for you. Um, you mentioned uh, part of the goals of the program is to show kids that they have choices, uh, to eliminate the fear uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, and to show them that they have a support network around them. Um, those are all sound like very universal uh, things when it comes to entrepreneurs. 
Um, and I was wondering, in the work that you do um, as an economic development officer um, in working with entrepreneurs, uh, can you reflect on some of the similarities you may see between, um, between the work you do with adults and the work that you've done here with, with children? That's interesting. I, I, I brought a little of that into the conversation, but I think all in all, at any age, entrepreneurship is scary. And owning a business is scary. And unless you have your community around you and the resources around you at any age, I really believe um, that people are uh, fearful a little bit of taking that risk. And you know, it's our job as economic developers in our communities to mitigate that and to show them that they have the community around them, the resources around them, the support around them to make them successful. That, we are a huge believer in that an entrepreneur and a business owner should never do it alone. And typically the business owners that try are the ones that unfortunately fail because they haven't been able to ask out and reach out for support. And it takes a community to really build a community of entrepreneurship and support each other um, in all aspects. We are big believers in connecting our businesses and our new startups with other businesses who have been startups. We are big believers in, you know, connecting our youth who are looking at starting businesses to other businesses who have been uh, in business for a while as mentors. Mentorship is a really big piece of that. You know, and I can honestly say in all of my years of this, I think entrepreneurship and business ownership um, is, is scary at any age, but if they have the resources and the community behind them, um, I think anything is possible. I know that sounds hokey, but it's true. Thanks, Tracy. Um, a couple more questions coming in through chat that I'd like to flag. Uh, so again, uh, if you have more questions, please um, put them in the, the chat window uh, if, you'd, if you'd like. And if we can't get to them, um, we can follow up. Um, or if you'd like to, to chime in on the line, uh, then that's fine as well. Um, we had a question uh, from Brent with the Libro Credit Union. And he was asking, did, did the county partner with any private firms or organizations uh, to help support this idea initially, and uh, and would they recommend this? Um, so I think around um, fundraising or sponsorship. Yeah, so we haven't yet, just because it's only been year two in the program, and we're dealing with, so the challenge in terms of some of those partnerships, maybe from a funding standpoint or banking financial standpoint, is that we're dealing with grades six, seven, and eight students, right? So 12 to 14 years old. We do a lot of partnership and collaboration at our high school level, uh, with uh, organizations, partners, funding organizations, our, our um, employment office, um, different banks, our CFTCs, where we actually connect um, our youth at the high school level with a lot of those partners. Um, and to be really honest, we're so blessed our community partners, uh, typically at that level in terms of the, uh, the youth level, are all gracious and, and offering, you know, no banking fees for the first year or this, this off for this or no fee for that. And realizing that, you know, we're, we're here to encourage those, uh, those youth entrepreneurs, um, you know, from the kidpreneur perspective, for us, I think we, a lot of these, these young children, grade 12, or excuse me, 12 to 14 year old, um, a lot of them do keep, make these summer jobs, um, which is really neat. Uh, many of them uh, are looking at kind of smaller companies which don't need as many resources, say, as a larger company would or, you know, a bigger, uh, bigger organization uh, would. But I think as they get older, for us, it's really important because it's that education piece that when they're in high school, you know, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that summer companies still stay strong. Um, but when they go through high school uh, and they do those, those summer job programs or they do start their own business in high school, that um, we will continue to work with them and supply those resources and tools. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a great response. And, and I think that it's exciting to see where this goes in terms of the, the take up of, as you, as you mentioned, you're looking to inspire um, kids in high school to pursue business classes. So hopefully that, uh, that sustains, uh, that interest sustains uh, over the long term. And I guess that sort of time will tell for that part of the project. Um, there's a, a question from, uh, from Jonathan here. Um, 
Great work, Tracy. Can you describe how you work with the four school boards in the area? And is, is there different relationships between the school boards and the individual schools that you're working with? Um, and, and how does that support the increasing the impact maybe? Yeah, so we have two school boards in our region. We have the Catholic School Board uh, and the Limestone School Board, which is our elementary public school system. Um, both school boards have been very supportive in terms of our work. Uh, to this point, basically, they've encouraged all of their schools, their principals within their schools, the administration, to kind of look at our program uh, and, and have given them the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to do the program. Uh, we're finding from the first year to last year, it's doubled in engagement. And we know that at some point, probably by next year, the year after, we'll have full engagement from you know, all of our participating schools in the region. Um, everybody's been very supportive and, and really understanding that we're not, the whole idea is we're not trying to push being a business owner to these young individuals. We're trying to let them know that they have choices. And that's really the best of it. Education is key, but the choices that they are allowed, they, they can make down the road are important. And we want to show them that business ownership as a choice is not as scary as they think. And, and you know, we've even heard from youth at the high school level will say, well, how come you didn't, you know, say in grade 11, I'll work with somebody in grade 11. And then I'll say, well, how come you didn't take business or entrepreneurship in grade nine? And they'll go, well, my parents, you know, they said that I didn't really need to take business and not because they didn't believe in it, but because the parents didn't understand what business was and entrepreneurship was. And so they're listening to their parents' guidance as well, which is great. We want that. But if the parents don't understand what business and entrepreneurship is, they're probably not going to be opening that as an opportunity for their children as well. So we want to just make sure that our youth have their eyes wide open in terms of those options. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, a lot of questions coming in over the line. Um, and again, if, if, we, if we miss one of your questions, we'll be sure to uh, try and follow up um, and, and help that get answered. And I'm um, happy if anybody wants to reach out to me as well directly. Wonderful, thanks, Tracy. Um, so maybe just a couple more questions. One question here about how do you access the younger people who may be less engaged and um, is there something about engaging at this um, at this age level that can help engage a wider audience than maybe there would be at, at a high school level where there's um, sort of more selective classes? Yeah, we in our research a couple of years ago when we were finding that you know the training gap was kind of at grade six, seven, and eights. You know, when you look at doing some studies in terms of the youth, uh, there. How can I explain it? Um, their learning capabilities are a lot more open when you're younger than it is when you get older. You have less stigma, you have less, um, not negativity, but you have, you have less experiences in terms of being a little jaded, right, when it comes to choices. And we just find that they're like sponges at that age. And so allowing us to be able to talk to them about, again, those choices, and just really define what entrepreneurship and business ownership means, we just find that they're more open to think of really neat things and be creative about it instead of worrying what people are going to think. There, there's that creativity mind is, is brilliant at that age range. Um, so do, don't really seem to have an issue uh, in terms of that engagement piece. I think as, as students get older, you know, say that grade 11, 12 timeframe, they're already thinking ahead in terms of what they want. We just want them to know that down the road, they can always have choices. Again, it's back to those choices, right? And, and just letting them know what it means instead of being fearful of it. I, I'd hope, I don't know if that answered that question or not. Yeah, that's great. Um, final question. Uh, it's sort of a sort of half in jest, I think, but they're asking if, if the logo for that program is under copyright. And I think that there's a little bit of a bigger question there of um, if communities are interested in, in using this model, uh, are you interested in working with them to, um, to help roll that out? Um, are you looking to expand this program uh, more broadly? 
Yeah, so we've been asked actually in our neighboring regions, uh, neighboring uh, communities on each side of us to help them with that as well. And very happy to speak with anybody about setting the program up uh, within their regions and the process. Uh, we are not sharing, for us, it's about doing this right across the board. And, and we are not, um, we work very well and closely with all of our uh, economic development partners across the region. And so be very happy to help you through the process. Uh, the logo, no, I don't believe it's been copyrighted. Uh, something to think about though, but uh, no, at this point, I don't believe it's been copyrighted, but very, very happy to, uh, to support anybody and you can reach out to me at any time. Well, thanks so much, Tracy. I appreciate your uh, generosity in, in sharing your story. Um, and it's certainly, uh, it's certainly one that's received great, uh, great reviews um, from uh, from the communities by the sounds of it and by, by EDAC. Uh, and just to mention as well, there's a, a short write-up about um, the Kid Printer story in, our, uh, in the ROI case studies, uh, which are available on our website. Um, again, in an attempt to give communities some, some background information before they get started on something like this. So th thanks so much, Tracy. And, um, I, I think we'll leave it at that for now and we'll let you get off to your busy day uh, throughout the county. Um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you so much and my apologies for leaving and good luck to everybody today in their, in their talks. Thanks, Thank you. Tracy. So I'd now like to, uh, to move along um, to Chris Garwood. Um, Chris is from uh, Norfolk County, and he'll be sharing uh, stories of a, um, another program working with the schools, um, but a little bit of a different twist in terms of um, taking it into the summer and supporting students uh, in starting a small business. So uh, Chris, uh, thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, and thank you for the opportunity um, to share our program. Um, like uh, Tracy, uh, our community is rural. Um, Norfolk County is population 65,000, single tier, but with a number of different towns and hamlets and kind of really spread out as well. Um, I'm happy for the opportunity to share what we do and to learn from others what they're doing. It's all about collaboration. So I'm more than happy to share um, how we did our program with anybody who is interested. Um, so the student startup program, uh, in a nutshell, I'll tell you in pretty much one sentence everything that the, the program is. It's um, geared at uh, elementary and high school students and from uh, grades six to 12. In the beginning, they get some money uh, to go out and start a summer business. They run the business through the summer. They provide us with a final report and for the, the, the option or for, to get a bonus uh, of an, another $100 and that's the program in a nutshell. So um, what I'll do though is I'll go to what the objectives of the program um, really is. And what we're looking to do is to spawn entrepreneurs, to get to the students from a very early age and to kind of plant that seed that uh, there's an option. And similar to what Tracy said, there's an option of owning your own business rather than just working uh, for a business. So we see this as a hatchery uh, for entrepreneurs and we're going to nurture them, we're going to support them, we want to see them grow. Um, secondly, um, very often in our rural communities, there might not be the same amount of opportunities for students to um, find summer jobs. So this is a, a viable alternative. Um, we want to encourage public private partnership. And this program does that beautifully. I'll explain later how that works. And then all of this is part and parcel of our youth engagement, youth retention strategy. So all that we're doing is towards these objectives. <clears throat> now, how does a program work? 
So what we do is we start at the beginning of the summer and usually um, from around June, we start engaging uh, with the schools and we go into all 26 schools. We have five high schools. We have 21 elementary schools. So we are targeting grade six to 12, as I said. And we make a presentation to the school um, of what the program is. Uh, in the beginning, it was a bit difficult and, and so on, but now most schools, they understand exactly what the program is. And so it's much easier. But we go in and we outline when the program will start, or when the program will finish. Um, we have a municipal budget. And so the municipality says, okay, for this year, you have $15,000. And then we have to go out in the community to get um, sponsorship from our business community. And we match that $15. We try to get another 15. The budget might be $30,000. Based on the budget we raise, that determines how many students will benefit from the program. Um, the, the, usually what happens is um, we have a uh, eligibility and it's written and it's on our website so everybody knows exactly what the rules of the game is. So they can, there will be no favoritism or whatever. What we try to do is we use our uh, partners, uh, community partners, um, and we have them help us to choose the students. So it's objective. And after they have been selected, then we start working with them. Um, some of these businesses and some other consultants we use uh, as mentors. And so we might have an insurance person, we might have a lawyer, uh, an accountant, um, and so on. And what happens is as they run their business, they might want, they might have a question for the lawyer. And he says, okay, I, I'm walking my dog and it, if it bites someone, what would happen? What would I have to do? And so on. Um, or they might say to an accountant, if I made X amount of money, um, what am I supposed to do? So what we're trying to do is to inculcate in them from very early the right steps that they should be taking in running their business, even though it might look like, oh, it's just a summer job. We want them to take it seriously and go through all the steps. What we have done is we have created what we call um, some marketplaces. And so we have approached all of the farmer's markets and we've said, listen, can you spare us two days when the students could come by and set up uh, their booth or tent and sell their wares. Um, and what we do is for those two days, they would have to, the, the um, coordinator of the market would have to sign that they did come in and that they did set up and the fees would be um, considered paid. So it's not free, but they do not pay, but it's considered paid. So it has been taken care of um, because we want to treat it just like a business. And um, we have every year we've added more marketplaces. So um, the festivals and we have like the street festivals, we have the um, ice cream festival, the Lynn Valley uh, Festival. We've gone to the festivals and we've said, um, can we have a booth there? And they've all um, pretty much said, yes, um, we can participate. And so the students will go there, set up their booth and sell and so on. For all the students who are going to be dealing with food, they have to go to the health unit they have to fill out that form and we walk them through, okay, this is what the fee is, it's paid. Um, you have paid it, uh, this is what um, um, you, you need to do. But they have to follow all, the, all of those um, requirements and they have to get their stamp from the health unit and so on, if they're dealing with, with food. Um, in terms of the payment, so for the initial seed money, their capital, investment they get two hundred dollars up front in their hands and they we say to them okay here is your seed money and they go off and they run their business and they come back now here is what we've done differently this year um, 
we have found that there, we have two groups of students that are in the program. One that are very eager to be here and want to learn. And then another that I, they more or less, they just want to be a part of the program. And, and some of them probably mom says that you need to do this or whatever. So there are always two groups, one very, very motivated and one that's rolling along. So what we've done is we have switched um, this year after three years from uh, mass marketing as many as possible to kind of target it to more uh, um, tasks oriented, more based on effort, more effort based. So now what we say is, okay, here's your $200 to start. You will get $50 for every marketplace that you go and sell. So that helps to encourage them to be more active in their business rather than just getting $200 and then not doing much with it. They want to go out and for every marketplace, they'll get a $50. So everything is capped anyway. So um, they, they, they can do two out of eight with fun. And then another thing now is in the final report before, we'd say, okay, just send us a picture, tell us what you did and so on. And <clears throat> what we do here now is we say, we need a comprehensive report. What were your challenges? What did you not expect? How could you have done things differently? How did you market? And so on and so forth. And it's almost like an exit interview, but it helps us to gauge how much they have learned, um, how much they were engaged in the program, and so on. So that's moving away from the one size fit all. Um, just to kind of summarize it, um, in the first year, we had about 40 businesses or 40 student businesses. In the second year, we had 98. Um, last year, we only had, we went back down to 39, and partly because we had some unfortunate uh, instance where we lost a, a Jerry, who was the main driver of it, so we had to just jump in and kind of put it together and so on. Um, but this program, it has won uh, provincial awards, uh, national awards, and so on. Uh, it's all about youth engagement, and we're very, very happy uh, how the program has gone. We're looking forward to growing the program. That's excellent. Thanks, thanks so much, Chris, for uh, for sharing that story. And um, I think it's a really great story from from the conversations we've had um, in in doing the case study. Um, the the community support that you're able to build from the business communities and and the example of, of showing that um, it's not only the students that don't need to go alone, but it's not the, the municipality or the county either, that, that you can lean on all these existing um, professionals in the community like accountants and bankers and, um, and other folks like that who can help coach the, the students. Um, and uh, do you have any, any additional thoughts on, on how important that is and, and on that idea of celebrating um, this program with the community and the type of community reaction um, that it garners every year? So in the beginning, um, when we just started, um, I think uh, it was very difficult getting into schools and, and that's understandable. They want to know what is this. The schools are not there for people to come and sell stuff. So we had to convince the, the principals and the boards uh, what we were doing. After the first year, um, we went out. In the first year, we did not have municipal budget because we were launching it and, and proving that, listen, this is what we want and this is what we are thinking of doing. Um, we got a lot of support from local businesses. So by the second year, like in the first year, we only had 12 sponsors. Um, by the second year, we were up to 27 sponsors. We had businesses come in and say, okay, here's $2,000 and so on and so forth. Uh, which showed that uh, they were really pleased with it. And to, this, to the extent that now, um, as soon as March rolls around, the businesses are calling us to say, is the program on? Am I done as a sponsor? When are you going to send for the funds? And so on. So, um, um, and, and part of it also that, that I'm heartened about is not only are they saying, here's my sponsor, but they're saying, 
how can we be a mentor to these kids? Can we walk them through our plans, our businesses? For them, can they come and spend a day with us to see what, what running a business is like? And so they, the community has embraced it in such a way that um, we couldn't have asked for better. And, and I think that's part of what makes the program so great, is that not only are the, the, the kids getting an opportunity to run their business, but the community is getting an opportunity to celebrate with them. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's very impressive, the community support. And I, I remember back to the, the story you told of the one marketplace um, in the community where it, it, it's almost a community party where everyone comes together to support the youth uh, in, in doing their businesses. Um, and it's something that everyone knows about in the community. And I, I think that kind of energy that's been created there makes this a really exciting story. Um, just wanted to read one, one quick comment from April Marshall, um, which is in the spirit of why we're all here together today and, uh, and why we appreciate all the folks who've joined on the line and for everyone sharing their stories. Um, April uh, from, uh, from Saugeen region, Southern Gray, Bruce, uh, Northern Wellington. Um, they've launched the program for the summer of 2019 uh, and they just wanted to note that they, they thank Norfolk for sharing and um, they're excited for the opportunity it will bring. So um, already seeing some, uh, some, some people building on, on that kind of work. Um, so thanks very much. Um, Chris, final question before we move on and we'll, we'll get a chance to, to come back um, for some, some questions later on as well. Um, but was there any kind of a hook for principals and teachers in terms of promoting the program in, in the schools? Um. Um, so I wasn't here for the first year that it ran, but I did hear that it was extremely difficult. Um, we had to go in and make presentations. We had to call in the the reps from the school boards, they wanted to know in detail what it entailed. Are we selling the students anything? Um, is this uh, an educational, um, is there an educational component? Will the students be learning something? And so on. Even though it was going to be in the summer, they had a vested interest in this being something that is of benefit to the students. Um, I think uh, where the hook was is the school boards. When we, um, members of the school boards came in and we explained to them exactly what the program was and how it would benefit the students and how it is, uh, it could add to, for example, students in the business classes. And they then um, kind of communicated it to the principals. Then it was kind of easier to get into the schools um, to kind of, do the PowerPoint presentation and, and so on because they have to coordinate the, the students in uh, like an assembly and we do a presentation uh, shows uh, um, like examples of other students doing their job and so on and so getting them all excited because okay we could do that and um, we had one student who was a county ambassador so he was supposed to he wrote blogs and promoted the, the entire county and everybody saw that as being cool, right? And then you see the benefit of just, not just a student learning something, but turning around and doing something for the community. So the community is benefiting from what he's doing. And now like the schools will call us to say, when is the presentation going to be? When should we put it on the agenda for the presentation? So, um, as, as long as the school board understands the program and kind of guides the, the schools as to what it is, you, you, would be, you should be fine. Thanks, thanks Chris. That's a, a great, uh, great insight in, into that question. Um, and, and I think the, the support year after year um, after sort of struggling in the first year really shows that once a community establishes that relationship with the school, that there is an exciting opportunity for an ongoing relationship uh, that's in the best interest of, of the students and of the community as well. Um, so it's that idea of risk taking um, and ourselves uh, as people working in organizations and, and 
for municipalities uh, that we need to think entrepreneurially sometimes as well uh, in terms of in terms of uh, taking that leap um, and and reaching out to the school. Uh, our next uh, speakers. Um, that's a great segue because our next speakers ha have done just that. They have um, taken on entrepreneurship uh, to the programming that they're doing and actually created a business, uh, a social enterprise to, to teach entrepreneurship. So it's a really exciting story. We have uh, Lois Shaw and Barb Smith with us from the Brock Youth Center. Uh, and they're going to share uh, a little bit about the Brock Youth Center and then um, the uh, the program that that has emerged from that um, the cool cow ice cream uh, parlor. So uh, very excited to have you on the line, and and I'll I'll turn it over to you both. Okay, well, thank you, Ryan. This is a great opportunity. We love to tell our story, and uh, welcome to everyone is online from Beaverton. Uh, not just those from Beaverton, but welcome to everybody. Um, so the Brock Youth Centre is unique as a youth centre in that we are virtual. We have no bricks and mortar. And so our programs, we either um, are involved in a digital programming or we travel to the communities where the where the young people are and we run our programs in the communities. We're based in uh, Beaverton, which is in North Durham, and we cover the townships of Brock, Scugog, and Uxbridge, so have a fairly large territory that we cover. And our focus is on youth entrepreneurship and building employability skills in kids, um, digital citizenship, and then as Ryan mentioned, our social enterprise, which is the Cool Cow Ice Cream Parlor. And Barb and Emily, who's going to be next, uh, were working uh, with the Brock Youth Center uh, a few years ago, and the Cool Cow is their inspiration. So Barb's gonna tell that story. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Lois. Um, my, my name's Barb Smith, and I am currently with the board of the Brock Youth Center, but I've been employed by the Brock Youth Center and have volunteered with the Brock Youth Center for uh, quite a number of years. Five years ago, we uh, had kind of a perfect storm of events that occurred. Um, the Youth Center hired both myself and Emily Morrison, who, like Lois said, you'll be hearing from next. And our board and uh, the staff uh, determined that youth entrepreneurship was a goal that we wanted to spearhead in all of North Durham. And because of being in a rural community and uh, uh, the lack of opportunities for a lot of our young people, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, something had to be done. We wanted to look at some sort of a, um, some sort of a social enterprise where we could teach about entrepreneurship kind of at the ground level. So Emily having run an ice cream parlor in her past and one of our board who was just closing an ice cream parlor in another, uh, in another location and had some fixtures that he wanted to donate, that was what um, brought this enterprise to the main street of Beaverton and Cool Cow was born. So five years ago, we started searching out and uh, the perfect opportunity, the perfect place for this ice cream parlor to exist. And we found a building that was, um, had been vacant for seven years on the main street of Beaverton. Um, and that, I have to explain, that was a, a great place for us to to be because there was so many vacant properties on the main street and uh, and the the town was truly suffering so we we rented a, a space on the main street it was pretty ugly and i think ryan will be showing some pictures of what it looked like before and after um, but that was the year where in our community the high school teachers had gone on strike and um, our students that that became involved they were they took the lead in in uh, painting the space and uh, cleaning it preparing um, the fixtures and the artwork and uh, getting getting everything ready so that we could go ahead and open our doors and you'll see the slide now that shows the before it was pretty dreary and then the after well the kids make it pretty exciting but uh, um, it, we really came a long way as far as what we were able to, to achieve. 
So the, the model around the Cool Cow Ice Cream Parlor was that kids would come, they would earn as they learned, um, they were the ones that would be creating their own schedules, they were the ones that were ordering the ice cream, the other supplies, they were diligent in cleaning, and they learned and delivered um, excellent customer service to, to anybody that attended or came in for, for ice cream. Um, we as staff, uh, we led them in the sense that, you know, they, they learned from us um, some of the skills that they needed to go ahead and do this and, and make it successful. They learned about insurance, they learned about business planning, um, and we, we pulled individuals in from the community to talk to, to the students one-on-one -on -one so that they had a better understanding of what business was all about. So at the end of the season, um, we worked with each of the students and every, every season we've worked with each of the students to revamp their resumes, to help them to uh, verbalize their skills and, and put it down on paper so that they had something to take forward um, as they entered into another job down the road. So what, what did this do for our community? So, you know, the the students themselves they they learned a tremendous amount it was um it was a great opportunity for them to be part of a team they they weren't criticized for for making mistakes because they were all in the same boat and they were all at that same level of understanding um but they they got um a lot of skills to carry on for uh if they wanted to open up their own business or if they were looking for another opportunity working for somebody else they, they ended up being um, excellent employees for others uh, but more importantly I think the the community support that we received was um, just outstanding uh, we had people that came forward to help in the sense that uh, they knew that we didn't have a whole lot of money to, to start the program and uh, there was gravel that was donated for our side alley seating area. Um, we had customers come forward and donate patio sets so that everybody could sit out and enjoy. Uh, we had uh, one of the uh, members of the community come and he was retired, helped us build a gate. Um, so little things like that, but it was personal, it was one-on-one, -on -one, and the, the community just enveloped the ice cream parlor and they were really proud of it. They were really proud that they would be able to help uh, each of these students. So the ice cream parlor opened in May 2015. Every year we have employed between 8 and 12 to 15 staff. Sometimes through the season, um, you know, more staff was needed. So uh, a plea would go out to the community and more interviews would be held. Uh, but the you have to understand with Beaverton as the same as most probably rural uh, small communities, the, the town pretty much dried up after five o'clock once the stores were completely closed and uh, Cool Cow, it, it brought life to the downtown. So what we found was that in the evening, people would come out, they would use Cool Cow as a meeting place, you know, seniors would come, young families would come, they would interact with each other, it became a real uh, social scene, um, and to, to make the, the atmosphere a little bit more inviting, the youth centre brought in some of their previous, um, previous uh, entrepreneurs that had gone through programs, and they you know, they played music or they entertained some of the clients and that just made it a really nice atmosphere. So um, further to the economic development, uh, like the impact within our community, um, we had uh, a change in ownership and uh, the, the excitement around Cool Cow actually helped to influence the, the new owners to purchase the the store where Cool Cow was located. Um, that has really helped to build community morale. Um, so we've we've you know we found that the the community is still grasping on and, and the space is just getting nicer and nicer. 
Now we know though that entrepreneurship is not that easy road and uh, this year we've, we've had a bit of a change. So in order to help us become more sustainable, the, uh, the owners of the building where we're located have mm, asked if we would be interested in changing our location within the same building, but to the back of the building. We were able to reduce our rent dramatically, which would help further the sustainability of the business. Um, but it set up its own set of challenges because we're beginning again. And uh, the slide that you see right now on the left is what the space looked like before we, um, before we started. And you'll notice that uh, the, the slide on the right or the picture on the right shows the improvements made to that area and uh, um, the, the tremendous impact it's having to the, the back space of the downtown. So it's interesting because where we're located, the parking lot, the municipal parking lot backs onto that and there's actually three times the parking spaces as there are on the main street. So hopefully that will help to generate um, a larger client base and and what we're seeing is that uh, the Cool Cow staff and Rock Youth Centre staff and board um, are just, they've got these tremendous creative ideas and they're making the, the space even more and more inviting and the space more exciting for visitors. So if any of you have never been to Beaverton, this is your chance because you'll be <laughs> seeing some pretty cool things going on. Um, so our sweat equity investment has helped to improve even more of our downtown core now, where, where I, I feel and I, I know that the board feels that we were instrumental in, in breathing new life into the downtown of Beaverton. We're doing that even more so into the back. And these students um, have been, they've been instrumental in these changes and we're acting on their ideas and helping them to be able to deliver those ideas and how do we make them you know uh, actual reality so they've done they've done just an excellent i just an excellent um a job but i've i've also found that having ambassadors throughout the community to help um to help deliver the message uh is is a huge benefit so we we're very very fortunate in our community we have some tremendous supporters and they're the ones who have been able to go out there and and help get that good word out about what we're doing um, but you know we've got we've got a number of testimonials from business owners and and uh, students themselves um, the business owners it's in interesting because they they have given us testimony that their sales increased since since Cool Cow um, brought more people out, uh, more people became aware because, you know, they would saunter through the downtown, they would become more aware of what was available within their own, within their own community. And um, it was, it's, it's been tremendous, um, tremendous support. Yeah. I'd just like to add a couple of uh, comments. So, I mean, it's been a real entrepreneurial learning experience for the young people. Um, so, as Barb mentioned, we've had some real ambassadors in the community, and we were very fortunate to have a, a, a local business owner, businessman, who paid for our rent um, initially. He paid for the rent in the off-season so that we only had to pay rent when we were actually earning an income from the ice cream sales. Um, and he did that for the first three years. And so once that was done, then we were responsible for um, paying the rent. And so it was really important that we reduced our rent. And so moving to the back of the building that we were in helped to support that. Um, but it's also presented some marketing challenges because we now have to really be creative in drawing attention to where we are located. So we're pulling the staff in um, and they're working on the marketing plan, coming up with some ideas. So it's a real learning opportunity for them that the, they don't just step into a business and, and everyone is, um, everything is there and set for them. They have to actually create their business if they want a job for the rest of 
the summer. Uh, and and in the money that we raise that, that over and above our expenses, so once we've paid our rent and all our um, supplies and paid our staffing costs, um, as a social enterprise, any of the funds over and above that goes to support programming at the Brock Youth Center. So our entrepreneurship programming that we do in the schools, in the high schools throughout the year, um, the other programs that we're starting um, in the summertime, and so it helps us to be more sustainable as an organization. Thank you, Lois and, and Barb. Uh, it's a really great story. Um, I think uh, that the financial sustainability of it is, um, is a really exciting thing to see that um, you have a program that teaches hands-on entrepreneurship skills um, and is able to pay for itself uh, and in, in good years uh, provide some, some funding beyond that for the, for the center. So I think it's exciting. The story of uh, downtown revitalization, I'd like to, to come back to that. Um, for sure, uh, in some of our conversations um, after we're, we've all presented. Um, I'm interested in some of your thoughts on uh, the, per, maybe the uh, intimidating idea of working with uh, these young people uh, day to day in the business who, for many of them, it's their first jobs, um, and, but at the same time trying to teach entrepreneurial skills. Um, if, if you could speak to uh, the role um, of coordinating that and then maybe the employee handbook as well um, so communities get a sense of what you might be able to share with them uh, in terms of facilitating that. Mm -hmm. So the employee handbook, I'll start with that. Um, that was something that we, we did start back in 2015 when we opened Cool Cow. Every year it's been added to um, just basic, simple things that we kind of come across and we think of, but it has made a really great um, comprehensive guide for any, any of the students and any of the, the Brock Youth Center staff that are taking, taking on the role of helping to coordinate. It's, it's been instrumental in, in helping, and I think if we continue uh, to add to it every year, it will be quite uh, an interesting document. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the coordination of, of the staff themselves, it, it's pretty interesting to watch them, you know, go through the process and, and you know, after you've explained the, how this is done and why it's done, then they make their own decisions and, um, you know, we, we haven't had to, to correct them too much because they're very logical and especially when they get the input from other staff within the organization, they, they are able to come up to, with their own conclusions and, uh, and really draw some, some good information from that. Mm -hmm. We've been sharing the, the financial <laughs> statements with them so that they know the impacts on their you know their day-to-day -day sales and and what's going to make um make things easier and better and of course it's kind of weather dictates a lot of that however um they're they're teaching their clients that ice cream is also good in cold weather because of some great ideas coffee coffee and ice cream is a great <laughs> beverage it's being quite well received uh, actually, we're, well, I find that it's fairly labor intensive at the beginning of the year as uh, because you're coaching the staff and it's university students that are at the lead are the managers of the business. And so they're available. They have that time where you can do that coaching initially and be open part time. So uh, the younger students that are still in high school um, have a chance to practice before they get really busy practice scooping ice cream and adding using a, a you know, cash register and that kind of thing and so the more they gain the skill set that's required to run the store then as staff we can back off and let them run with the show so it's kind of it's pretty intriguing to see the way that they grow in skills and what they learn um, throughout the process mm -hmm. yeah thanks for those comments and uh, certainly coffee flavored ice cream is, is one of my favorites as well so not just <laughs> Coffee and ice cream. Um, I had one uh, question uh, from the chat box here, and I would encourage anyone on the line if they've uh, done their own social enterprise around uh, youth engagement or youth entrepreneurship, uh, you can quickly come on the line and share that with us as well. 
Um, certainly nice to hear that there are different models. I, I think one of the exciting things about this for me is the scalability and that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about ice cream, that you have a lot of the structures and frameworks and the employee handbook in place that there could be different businesses that uh, would fill a niche in a downtown, um, but the, a lot of the principles are the, are the same. Um, so I would invite that, that's an open invitation to anyone on the line, but just quickly, um, look, when looking at challenges like the weather or something like that, how have you been using social media at Cool Cow to help uh, promote youth entrepreneurship, uh, social enterprise, and, and to drum up business as you've been going? Well, I have to say that uh, we have a young lady that works with the Brock Youth Center, Allison, and she is just doing a dynamite job on our social media. She's very creative. And I had someone uh, from a, meet, a smaller media organization come up to me the other day and ask who was doing it. And I said who it was. And they said, well, she's doing such a great job. So I made sure that Allison knew that she, if somebody offers her a job, she's not to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to keep her. So, uh, and she, you know, Know, where if we've had a couple of days where the weather has been just so bad that we've decided to close the shop early the thunderstorms and it sounds like you're in the middle of the sky in the building we're in now if, when there's a thunderstorm so um, and she's you know just got these great messages out on social media and people are seeing them and are responding and saying oh that's a great message so uh, and she's covering all of the all of the platforms so that we're reaching the adults through Facebook uh, kind of both generations, kids and adults on Instagram and also using Snapchat to reach the younger people. So um, we're using all of the platforms to tell our story and also to promote our ice cream and our hours and, and all of that. So it's been great. She's doing a great job. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Is there any other questions from on the line for now uh, before we move along? I think we'll, we'll have some time to come back and, and, and speak more broadly about uh, some of the impacts uh, that we've seen fr from the stories we've heard. So hearing none, um, very excited uh, last, but certainly not least. Emily, if you'd like to, uh, as, as Barb mentioned, Emily um, was instrumental in, in the um, in developing Cool Cow uh, ice cream. So if you'd like to add any comment to that before you get started, I would invite you to do that. Um, but Emily is with us from uh, Launchpad uh, Youth Activity and Technology Center in Hanover, Ontario. She's the executive director there. Um, and she, Emily has a really great story there around, um, it's, it's a drop-in center, but the, the type of skill building that they do uh, with the young people and connecting them to, to local employers. Again, a, a, a similar but different spin on, on some of the stories we've been hearing thus far. So we're excited to have Emily with us. Hi everyone. Um, hope, thanks very much for, for taking the time and inviting me to be here today. And I'm super happy to follow up uh, with Barb and Lois because yes, Barb and I were the ones that started the ice cream store together and it was an amazing experience. And when we talk about community development and, and community participation, it was really awesome to have the ice cream store be such a vocal viewpoint of the downtown so that the public can see that. And I think that's a pretty important thing if you can intertwine that into any youth entrepreneurship program is making sure the public sees it. But also at the same time, in the off season, we, our local community did the like downtown improvement program and our youth in the ice cream stores, they they competed in that downtown revitalization program and one um, store from each of our three towns in, in that municipality competed and then our ice cream store ended up winning. So, so again, it was another way to put the youth in a community program that was already existing. You know, I had such an amazing opportunity um, with the Brock Youth Center, them believing in our crazy ideas, but um, I wasn't from Beaverton. I, from a small town of Lucknow and I'm a strawberry farmer there. And so I, I kind of had that pull to come home. Um, so when a job opportunity opened up at home, um, it was the work decision, the status decision, but also I was um, super excited to go home and be a part of my farm. And then it was when I was at home that I found Launchpad and, and my heart just exploded again with the opportunity to be here. And so because 
I had that entrepreneurship experience at Brock Youth Center and an entrepreneurship program at Launchpad hadn't been uh, focused on or had been created yet, I knew that that was the pitch that I needed to, to bring to the table. And so Launchpad is a youth center. We're open Tuesday to Friday, 3.30 to 8 for the drop-in time. But then we also do structured after-school programs on top of that. And we have different spaces in our youth center. So welding, we have a welding shop, we've got a kitchen, we've got a technology lab, and we have um, we just opened up a wood shop this year. So we've got the different opportunities. And so there were youth coming when I got here. I've got been here for just about a year and a half now. There was youth utilizing the different spaces and so and just creating on their own. And that was really exciting to see. And when we have a local farmer's market, and so what Launchpad did was we purchased a spot in our farmer's market and then we let youth be inside that farmer's market and use our space as a tool to, to sell their wares. And we teach them those business principles. And so we have a young um, man and he makes cookies in our kitchen and sells them through to local businesses and local cafes and, and does pre-orders. And so we sat down together and said, okay, you're gonna be selling these in the farmer's market. Um, what's your cost of ingredients? What's your, um, you know, how much are you selling them for? And when and he didn't know, he didn't know. And he was, his mom or dad was always coming in and helping him bake the cookies. Um, he was paying $5 to rent the, the kitchen at Launchpad each time he made the cookies. And so we said, you know, when, and when he broke all that stuff down and when we worked through it, he realized he was only making two cents per cookie um, when he was selling them. And he thought that was great, but his parents didn't think that that was great at all. And so, when the, and so it was really cool to sit down and, and walk him through that process. And, and then again, when we talk about putting your youth in front of the community, then when the community came to the farmer's market, and saw our tent that had our launch pad logo on it and saw what the youth were making. We had another youth, her grandmother makes jewelry and had taught her how to make jewelry. And so she was making the jewelry at the youth center and then selling them. Um, it was pretty awesome to be able to to have that be um, a vehicle that we could teach our youth entrepreneurship at the youth center, you know, doing things that they love and their passions and, and teaching them and, and having that farmer's market and, and launch pad purchasing that vendor spot for them to be there. You know, we did, um, I remember the ice cream store experiences there. I said, I would not worry about the kids schedule. It was their, their responsibility to build their own schedule and kind of, again, at that farmer's market saying, you know, a youth can't just have their product there. They have to be there to sell it, to talk about it. But, you know, understanding it summertime, summer vacation, they had to, you know, we struck a deal and said, okay, if your product is going to be there, but you're not going to be there at the farmer's market, uh, you have to pay $2 to, to, you know, to cover and say, and give and teach your other youth that are there how to sell your product. And so, that was really a good experience for them too. You know, uh, and that entrepreneurship and youth entrepreneurship, we're really excited again to start up kind of a wintertime activity. Um, and this is one that everybody, I hope everybody steals it and brings this back to your home community. Um, there's a program called Technovation. It was put out by IBM and it's a way for youth to, uh, for girls to identify problems in their community and solve it by creating a mobile app, coding a mobile app. And so we have been doing that in our three local high schools. We've got a team from each and, uh, and we're gonna have our final pitch competition at launch time next week. And so the girls with their apps, they have to decide if it's gonna be a for-profit, not-for-profit or charity, their business plan, their growth. And one of the parts is to submit it to the IBM World Competition. And if they win Canada, um, IBM will fly the girls down to California to be able to compete against uh, girls from other parts of the world. And it's super exciting, but we wanted them to maximize on the experience. So we're having our own local pitch competition and we're getting our mayors of our three local communities to be the judges so that the mayors can see the youth identifying problems in their community and coming at them with solutions through their mobile apps. And so it's really exciting to be able to teach that entrepreneurship uh, through coding, through you know, STEM, through, through community development. And we're really excited to then not only highlight 
the business aspect of entrepreneurship, but also to highlight the opportunities that entrepreneurship is able to impact a small community and a rural community and, and their community development. So those are the two things that because of the strong foundation in entrepreneurship that I had at the Brocky Center and just seeing that when a youth is able to get to take ownership of something and, and to feel that empowerment and to feel that opportunity to build, we saw such an amazing change in youth that when I had the opportunity to come home and then be a part of Launchpad, um, it was it was a foundation to, to bring entrepreneurship to Launchpad and I've been super excited with the work that we've done so far. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'd like to, to probe a little bit further. Um, I, I think often when we've, we've heard a little bit uh, from Tracy earlier about um, trying to alleviate some of the um, intimidating aspects of, of being an entrepreneur, uh, I think one of those can often be for any of us uh, is do you have the skills to uh, create a business? Do you have some kind of a skill that um, you can turn into a business? Um, can you speak a little bit about the work that Launchpad does as a youth center um, and the advantage they have in, in terms of the access to so many youth, but the types of programming that you offer um, around skill building and connecting that with the community? Um, and then how that, um, how you see that uh, potentially uh, turning into young entrepreneur. Right. Um, so when we, a strategy when, when I was at the Brock Youth Center with Barb, and then also I've replicated here. So when we've done high school presentations, we've gone into the classrooms and done the business canvas model. And so really quickly, you can show a classroom of youth working together. And if you bring little Halloween candy or chocolate bars and, and for every time they answer a question, you give them a chocolate bar, it really gets the ideas flowing. Um, you know, that there is a very quickly be able to make a business plan, point form notes through the business model canvas template um, to be able to show them it's not as hard as you think it is to come up with a business plan. Um, at the same time, uh, we do run an after-school program as a part of our spring session called I'm the Boss, where youth come to the youth center and there's a staff member here over the eight weeks helping them build their business plan so that when the farmer's market starts up the first week of June in the middle of June, they're ready to go and have thought it all through with a mentor there. And so then also during that eight-week after-school program, we're bringing in a representative from the summer company program. I'm lucky to have April Marshall close to, to me who had already said that we were replicating the, the STEP program. And so we've had her come in and talk to the youth about startup fund opportunities and bringing in those different mentors. So that because Launchpad has that after school program structured already, we've been able to build in an entrepreneurship course that kind of leads then into the farmer's market opportunities. That answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess um, just hoping you might be able to highlight uh, things like your welding shop and your uh, and your uh, uh, woodworking shop and things like that as well as sort of those skill building opportunities. Right. So with the welding shop, we've got different programs, and we're seeing that 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 divergence. You know, you uh, female youth are coming in. And, and taking part in the welding classes, which we're really excited about. And one of our strongest welders is a 15-year-old girl, and she's just really into um, doing that different art and creative side of welding. At the same time, you know, people are starting to recognize that we have a welding shop and that our youth are awesome. We're trying to get the promotion up there. And so we had somebody come in and, and say, I've got this project, I need help. And Alyssa, our girl, she, um, through her after school program was able to, to provide and build that piece of work that our youth needed, uh, or sorry, that person needed done. So she's kind of starting her little side business through the, the welding shop. And then with us just opening the wood shop, you know, we're hoping that we can create a social enterprise out of that. You know, we're working now to figure out, okay, can we build picnic tables, flower boxes? Can we sell them to our municipalities? And through building that and then teaching 
the entrepreneurial skills and the employment skills we're able to kind of do on the job training, just like Cool Cal Ice Cream Store, but utilizing the other spaces at the youth center. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Emily. I, I think that's um, those are all really exciting, and and it's it's nice to see too. We had a question earlier about accessing youth, um, and because this is outside of the high school, uh, there certainly is a, a different opportunity for accessing um, uh, youth from different um, socioeconomic backgrounds. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, on on the type of youth that you're working with, and and how you try and reach out to different groups. Right. So. Launchpad is for youth 12 to 18. Um, when we talk about going to schools, I think it's really important to keep, even though we are separate from the high school, we are outside, it's really important for us to have the presence there. A lot of people talk about going to the principals and I totally agree with that. But if you can also hit up your vice principals because they're, they are a more direct frontline worker with the youth in, in their high school. And so having the vice principal be your best friend and usually they're more accessible as well compared to the principal um, and just ensuring that that they're on your side is because they're the ones that will be able to connect you with the business teachers and the guidance counselors as well and again there's hitting up a vice principal um, they usually have more access and they're in the school more than a principal might be so that's a big advocate there but at the same time when you're doing your marketing you really have to put yourself in the shoes of, of a teenager. And today, there's so much going on. There's so many methods, but at the same time, they're being bombarded by so much stuff. And you really have to lay out the value propositions and what it means, what they will receive when they participate in your program. And so laying that out, you know, your poster is, it needs to a limit, think of all the questions, make sure you answer it and try to reduce barriers as well. So, you know, having your programs, if you can do them on lunch hour, if you're trying something new, information, oh, you're asking at lunchtime at the high school. So you're really eliminating a lot of barriers for you to participate. And then um, talking a lot to community service groups, um, talking to their parents, doing presentations as much as you can out in the community, getting, you know, we all know that, um, you know, our newspapers are really interested in local content. And if you write an article uh, for them and include a picture, there's nine times out of 10, they'll print it exactly what you need. So um, making sure to get the word out and talking to everybody so that you have all aspects of your community impacting the youth and telling them about your program. Thanks, Emily. And uh, I, I think you addressed in a lot of ways a question from Marty on the line, um, asking if you'd connected with any of the local service groups in the community. He was mentioning that, that they have a super active Leo club uh, in the community and they raise money for seeing eye dogs as an example. Uh, but maybe there's a model where their entrepreneurship is used to raise funds for their club cause. So connecting people who are already fundraising, but um, connecting in some entrepreneurship um, ideas into that. Um, and sort of a entrepreneurship with a social uh, outcome. Um, have, have you looked at that as an idea? It's, it's a nice idea. Yeah, for sure. No, um, connecting with your, your local service groups because more often than not, your entrepreneurs in the community understand the importance of being a part of a community group. And so being able, having them know who you are and then bringing those entrepreneurs in, you know, it's really good also for youth to see a pathway to success or if, or if youth are really congregating at a cool cafe in the community or if there's um, a local skateboard shop in your community and that entrepreneur bringing them in to meet the youth and, and seeing you know, a really hip cool mentor in their community being successful if they're able to talk to somebody that owns the space or runs the space mm -hmm. that the youth hang out in, it's gonna, they're just gonna feel that invigoration and be so much more excited. And so talking to your local service groups, you can get those mentors, you can get those specialty people in to come and talk to them. You know, when we had the ice cream store, we had staff meetings every week, but we had a guest speaker come and, and having, being a part of those service groups, you're able to meet new people that are most likely gonna come out and support you and your initiative to help the youth all around. Thanks, Emily. Um, 
Question from Amy Beaven uh, up in Timmins. Uh, how did you recruit individuals to teach youth welding, cooking, carpentry, et cetera? So finding those skilled workers who can, can help with the teaching. Right, so our biggest volunteers are retired industry professionals. Um, again, maintaining that close relationship with the high school. So you've even got some retired high school teachers and current teachers um, coming and teaching us in our after school program. Um, reaching out to our unions um, our local unions, you know, we were wondering, we've got, um, you know, we're super lucky to, to be so close to Bruce Tower um, and, and trades are a big part of our community. And so there's lots of unions here. So um, reaching out to them has been pretty awesome. But again, um, retired industry professionals. And again, that's kind of also where the service group comes in is that you know we have a lot if they're retired and presenting to them and you always doing an ask for a call to volunteers um that's also where we get our volunteers from thanks emily um another question uh from lauren burkhardt um who was wondering if you can speak about teaching leadership in conjunction with entrepreneurship skills yeah, for sure. I think a lot of times leadership is just all about about showing up and and communicating with the people that you're working with and who you interact with. And so so teaching that eye contact skills, those soft skills, those you know we have after school programs, uh, showing up on time, respecting your instructor, respecting the space that you're in, and and then all of that has a ripple effect. So. Right now, we're even as a team uh, coming together, and we have eight-week programs that just focus on um, the skill that we're teaching. Um, we also teach as a part of our skills. Like the youth are the ones that have to clean up. The youth are the ones that have to make sure this space looks like how they came in. And and even with our welding shop, it's growing, and we need um, tanks of gas to be able to make the the welding shop run. And you know, if we're ever run out then it impacts everybody and and the 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 truck that comes to fill up our gas doesn't doesn't come every day and it only comes once a week so now the youth are having to record the levels of 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 gas left in each tank at the end of their program so again it's giving them that responsibility but at the same time what we are thinking about now is extending our after school program to 10 weeks only having eight weeks with the instructor. So again, that you know, they're volunteering, giving their time, but to see how can we maybe do more of that leadership training in our after school program. And, you know, because we need to teach those leadership skills and those soft skills for our next generation to be able to become the leaders and the community drivers that we need. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah. Great insights into leadership um, and the, the relationship with entrepreneurship. Certainly, it's uh, closely closely knit. Um, I know as we're approaching the end, uh, folks may be leaving uh, for lunch engagements, but I would like to put it out to the to the folks on the line um, to see if there's any reflections on, on some of the things uh, that they've heard today. Um, again. In the spirit of sharing, uh, we'd like this uh, to happen throughout all of the webinars uh, that are coming up as well, is that we can hear from some of the great work or, or some of the great minds that are on the line. So I would, if anyone has uh, some ideas around that, I would invite you to chime in um, and uh, let your face be, be seen to the group. Um, I, I would like to offer one of my uh, reflections on, on what we've been hearing. Um, from everyone is the uh, is the exciting uh, idea of when we're working with youth, the type of support um, that the community uh, really wants to rally behind youth, um, and it's youth entrepreneurship. Um, so it has that uh, it has that component to it, but that there's so much opportunities to engage with the communities, and we've seen um, all the way through uh, all of the examples today that type of community support. Um, that has been instrumental in delivering the programs um, and also what the youth are able to give back to their community. So we've seen examples of um, tangible uh, downtown revitalization happening. Are there any thoughts from any of the folks on the line who'd like to jump in? So 
while we wait for someone, uh, because I know there will be someone, I'd like to, I'll put that to the, the panelists. Do you have any reflections on, um, generally speaking, why fostering entrepreneurship at a young age um, amongst youth is, is good, is important for rural communities in, in Ontario? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and answer, Chris. I have a comment on uh, leadership, uh, youth leadership, but I will, Chris, if he's responding to the question that you just asked, uh, Ryan, then I will speak when he's, after he's responded. Thank you for that. Um, I don't think we can um, underemphasize the, uh, or overemphasize the importance of, um, of starting to introduce our young people to the possibility of owning their own business from very early. <clears throat> One of the things that um, I remember distinctly is when I, um, I had a, a conversation with my own son and I was going through budgeting and telling him, okay, when he goes to his own house, this is what he needs to do and starting to save. And, and one of the things he said to me was, um, so why didn't they teach us this in school? This is like something that we're going to, everybody will need in life. And they never taught us in school. And it struck me that <clears throat> some of the basic things that we would have, we would assume that they will just know, they don't. So um, if we don't, introduce them to uh, uh, business as an option, if we don't introduce them to what running a business might be and for them to get a, a, a chance to put their toes in the water, then when they grow up, they won't even know that that option exists. But if we can start them off young, have them exposed to it, even though it's in a very small setting, then at least we have planted the seed and um, I know of uh, quite a few of our young uh, entrepreneurs in, the, in, in Norfolk County. They started out going to the office uh, with mom and dad and seeing mom and dad in the, in the business working. And they just automatically uh, graduated in the business. Um, so for some of the students that, who would not have the benefit of have mom and dad having a business, this is an opportunity to introduce them to, uh, to business. Thanks, Chris. Um, Lois, did you want to chime in with your reflections? Um, yes, um, it's been mentioned several times how important those entrepreneurial skills are for young people, whether they choose to own their own business or to work for someone else. One of the programs that we're going to be initiating this year is Youth Leading Youth. So young people who have been through the entrepreneurship development program that, that we do, we're going to um, sort of pull them in and give them some of those leadership um, skills to lead a group of younger uh, youth in developing their own business. So we're, we're going to be running this over the summer. Um, and so we're going to connect with the high school youth, give them that leadership training so that they in turn can lead the younger youth in building um, a, a business on, on a simpler level. And then we will be there to coach them as they lead and, you know, to mentor the younger kids should they need that as well. Great, thanks, thanks, Lois. Um, I will leave a few seconds open in case anyone wanted to chime in and build on any of those ideas. So there is a, a comment from uh, from Marty, um, these programs, which seem to be about youth entrepreneurship, they reach so much further, uh, revitalizing communities, uniting people, creating leaders for the future, enhancing the rural fabric. Uh, and a really insightful comment. Um, and, and certainly, I think one of the exciting things about entrepreneurship is that it doesn't need to be the next Microsoft. It can be um, organizing a group of people to solve a local community issue of, of all kinds. And, uh, the people who have created the programs, um, while they're delivering a service, they're, they're being entrepreneurial. And, and so we're very excited to, to be with a group of entrepreneurial people who are we're focused on that. Um, 
what, maybe one final question for everyone uh, from, from Pat Shaw. How do we make entrepreneurship exciting and fun uh, for youth? Or have you already done it with Cool Cow? Well, okay, I'll jump in right away. Um, but how do you make it fun and exciting? It's telling them, one, you need to make sure that the person going out there and communicating the programs and communicating the value of entrepreneurship has that epic personality. You know, what, what you give off is what you get back. And so uh, making sure that you've really pinpointed the right person to go out and share that entrepreneurship story and, and you're talking about the programs that you're doing. At the same time, um, you know, tell them about the awesome values that it is to be an epic entrepreneur. You know, you're building something. You're a part of every single decision. You're a part of every single, and it like part of the business and it all falls back on you and you can grow it at the same time. You know, you're able to build your own schedule, um, make the own decisions. And, and it's cr pretty exciting to, to be, to be an entrepreneur and, and to build something that you love and to take what you love and get money from it. Uh, so just making sure that, that all that intrinsic stuff and that, that exciting stuff about owning it, building it, getting the rewards from it is, is pretty awesome to make entrepreneurship fun and exciting. But if you can, one, remember that it's turning your passion into a business, um, doing what you love, making money from it, but then also when you're trying to advocate and, and show off your entrepreneurship programs to the community and get youth engaged, you need to make sure you've got that right person and, and practice the, the presentation to go out there and, and, and just share the love of entrepreneurship. Thanks, Emily. I think, I think that's a great note to close on unless there's any, any final thoughts from any of the other panelists. I would like to, uh, uh, before we move on completely, just a quick reminder to folks uh, that we do have a series of, of events coming up and uh, we really appreciate everyone's participation, especially the folks who are hanging on the line here, excited to go off to lunch and, and maybe get a nice cream cone on their way back to the office. Um, we are looking at a, a number of different uh, ways that people are are building programs to support entrepreneurs in rural Ontario. Um, the one that's coming up next on June 6th, same time slot, uh, it's looking at repurposing space. Um, that's a really exciting one. We're, we're looking at what the United Church is doing um, to use its underutilized space to provide a, a community innovation hubs and co-working spaces, um, new opportunities and programming for entrepreneurship through there. We're looking at the Elgin Innovation Center, um, which is a, a revitalized, uh, the former uh, tobacco plant in Aylmer, Ontario, has been turned into a sort of a industrial incubator of sorts with, um, with flexible workspace and, and uh, on-site coaching and, and mentoring through Community Futures. Um, and we're also looking at what Prince Edward County has done uh, to preserve one of their local public schools but also to create um, uh, a commercial food incubator uh, and commercial kitchen on site at the school. Um, so they're leveraging that uh, a new uh, not-for-profit organization to help, uh, to help revitalize and maintain the school. Um, and they're working with the Agri-Food Venture Center to, to do their programming there. So a, a really nice um, assortment of approaches to repurposing space in rural communities um, and, and offering new programs uh, to support entrepreneurs. Um, certainly there's a, a number throughout June um, for you to sign up on. Um, if you've yet to do it, uh, you can accept the, the calendar invitations that we've sent along uh, so that you have a reminder there. Um, and please feel free, anyone who would like to reach out to me, um, uh, I'm, I'm open to any questions, comments, uh, and, and any troubleshooting that you need. Um, so I will, uh, without further ado, I will uh, conclude this webinar for the day. Thank you very much to all of our panelists uh, for showing up, and thank you to everyone uh, on the line. 
um, for your uh, for your comments and questions and and for your attention to this and and I hope that everyone is able to take a little bit of inspiration uh, or maybe uh, maybe some people are going to be looking to uh, to to build some of these programs into their offerings so so thank you very much to everyone.